Oh, we might need that. So, hi everyone. Welcome to the class. My name is Tim. Uh, I'm with Magicraft, co founder of Magicraft with Josh Wolf. Couldn't be here tonight, unfortunately. Uh, he's doing a landmark event. Uh, shout out to Just Digital People. Who, Josh is a legendary recruiter at uh, Just Digital People. So, at Magicraft, we teach kids how to code through the metaphor of magic in Minecraft. So, the idea is that. Uh, some live demos, here we go. So here's a little demo walkthrough. This is Minecraft, obviously. We provide an IDE which allows you to write magic spells in JavaScript, which then you can save. They get uh, piped into Minecraft, and then you cast them as spells. So that's casting a fireball spell that you just somebody just wrote in um, JavaScript. So why Minecraft? Minecraft is the best-selling computer game uh, to date. It's over 106 million copies sold around the world. And it's actually the second uh, best-selling video game of all time. Does anyone know what the best-selling video game of all time is? It's Tetris. <laughs> so this is Josh Wolf. He founded the company uh, based on a desire that his son should learn how to code, his 14-year-old son. Uh, but the school system is fairly insufficient in that regard these days. It struggles to keep up with the evolving technology. And obviously, the school system's a big institution. They move a bit slowly. So I thought, maybe he can do something himself. At the time, he was uh, mentoring at um, uh, Koda Dojo. And he asked the kids, hey, do you want to uh, mod Minecraft? And the kids went completely nuts. So he uh, started hacking away on some stuff. It turned out to be a bit more difficult than he expected, but in the end, he came up with uh, Magicraft. And that was about June last year. And uh, since then, we've run a bunch of events. Uh, developer conferences are a big thing for us. Um, after school programs. At the moment, we'll get to that a bit, but we're kind of re-rolling our tech stack so we can um, make more of a uh, entrance into school systems doing uh So you know you've really made it when kids ask you to come and hold ma magic art events at their birthday parties. And we've actually <laughs> recently crossed that milestone. So we can now do parties. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you wear a costume? Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, of course, the blocky heads. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that was actually a couple of weeks ago. Our player one, uh, who's at Ascot State School, uh, Ruben, meteorite. Right. Um, his father, no, he was up. His father asked him, like, "What do you want to do for your birthday?" And he said, "I want a magic craft birthday party." <laughs> so we uh, we turned up there with our laptops, and he had eight of his friends sitting around with Minecraft themed party food. And yeah, we, we taught them how to do a, a lot of attack spells. They spent a long time killing each other, and then they decided that was a bit boring. So we, we showed them some other stuff, and then we rolled out our new stack, which was a bit broken at the time, but uh, still, it was a really great event. Uh, so yeah, this is an event last year. This is actually at NDC Sydney. Uh, Josh went down there with uh, his son Prahlad. And out of that actually, he got an uh, offer to come to um, Norway next year. This year actually. So he's heading there around the middle of the year with his son. This is actually a developer, developer, developer. The DDD conference. Uh, and these three uh, boys became uh, regular content contributors, they built some pretty far out worlds, and I recently uh, tasked them with building a uh, volcano world, so they turned into that. This is also NDC, this is actually at this auto and general building upstairs, so thanks, big thanks to uh, Chris Dewar for uh, organizing that. Woo, what a car! <laughs> <laughs> that was a really rad event, uh, I think we had 40 or 50 people there, there's Josh in the front. Uh, this is actually at the Edge. We work a lot out of the Edge, State Library Queensland. Uh, this is actually us supporting our remote events. So we had 15 kids log in from around Australia, uh, and we were supporting them online. We had like a one-to-one -one, uh, support team ratio there. Oh, this is a, a shout out to um, Tim Smith, who is actually a developer, 
he came to DDD, he was sitting there with his like super keyboard and stuff, and he, an older guy, um, and we gave him his own server to experiment with stuff. I'm going to demonstrate some okay. of the spells that I've written for the Minecraft mod, Magicraft. He's a, uh, I don't know, 30 something. Oh, okay. First one's Spawn. Let's take He's a not a kid, that's what I'm oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And run the demo. So these aren't kid spells we normally give to kids, but it just demonstrates <laughs> that using our, uh, our framework, you can write all sorts of uh, cool spells. That's going to hold them temporarily. Uh, maybe an airstrike to open up that jail. An explosion to finish off the stragglers. Or a sequence of explosions. Say a thousand of them, strength 10. This is, this is how you really mine in Minecraft. Two dollars drill scale. Press in the sneaker key, and then you can just them in case you don't want to pull thousand. Uh, there's also the path button, which is a nice line. Oh, and the jail can be made of anything you like. So, for example, obviously that's going to off TNT. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> And so what this will also start to demonstrate to us is if we give people who have some level of programming ability these tools, they won't really start pushing them. So for example, I have my younger brother who, you know, he's an electrical engineer, he knows how to code a little bit in C, and he decided I want to make a spell that would cause me to jump and then jump again, then jump again, like a little way that jumps. And of course, we can't give people the ability to create infinite loops, we can't give them you know, the ability to you know, set timeouts. So he tried to implement from scratch the set timeout feature in JavaScript all over again using daytimes. I've never seen the server burn up so fast. <laughs> Help. So this is a, a Tuong library over the Summer of Magic, we call it. So a little bit about our tech stack. This was like the early MVP. This was actually written by Chris. Turn.js, it has um, particle.js in the background, which provides some like sparkles. It opens up, you can actually turn the pages. And you can see on the uh, left, you've got some documentation. And on the right, you have an IDE, and that's actually where you write your spells as JavaScript functions. Save them, you get a little message which says, now go to Minecraft and type cast spell name, which is the function name, and then if you've, written it, if you've written it well, then you'll get your spell effect. And then, so... So it turned out, when you combine Turn.js, Particle.js, and AngularJS into one melting pot, you unleash hell. It took me five minutes to explain to people how the rendering engine worked, because Turn.js has these structured divs, and Angular's like, I don't care about the structure, I'm going to create and smash them as much as I want. And so we realized really quickly, it was super cool and kids loved it, but developing it was a nightmare, as you can imagine, when you combine these three libraries. So then we went to V2 of React. Yeah, so around, actually, at Fishburner's Christmas party, I was pitching to Josh saying, like, I want to rebuild it. Uh, I want to add some quests into it so we can, like, storify our uh, content. Basically, you can do a quest. It gives you, like, a, a story context. You go in there, you learn a few spells, which are actually coding lessons for kids. And then you complete the quest and you get a next quest. So I had this kind of rough mock up in my mind, and we started hacking away there with um, Knockout, and jQuery, and stuff. And then a few days later, Josh said, Right, I'm on break. 
who works full time at JDP. And he was like, right, I'm break. I'm gonna uh, make this a project while I'm on holiday. So then he ripped it back and started an uh, epic rebuild, which Ian will take you through. So, as Tim said, uh, he mocked up a knockout uh, view, and we almost had it ready and right to go to start tying into Magicraft. Uh, but then one night, Josh decided, let's go to React. <laughs> <laughs> so we redeveloped the whole whole project in React, and we first we tried Nanoflux Fusionator, but it wasn't doing what we wanted exactly for state. <coughs> so then we briefly moved to Redux for about five minutes, and then off to RxJS. So a little bit why we needed that. Yeah. Um, we <coughs> didn't really preserve our player state before that with our mm. MVP. So basically every time we'd blow away, we create the server. Uh, they'd have to start from scratch. Their, yeah. All their spell library was gone. So we added PouchDB, <coughs> and then we attached that to Redux to provide our application store as the as the backdrop for the yeah. Okay. So. As, we, as our product projects start to grow, we start to have issues with knowing what shape our objects are. So um, we're having some minor errors, things we're making mistakes on. So then along came TopScript. So we spent about two or three days, I think, just making our constants and our object shapes and fixing up linting and all that kind of stuff. And then we're all happy, yeah, hey, it's all, all TypeScript and working great. And we started to progress again on the project. Now, the way that Minecraft at that time was sending the objects from Minecraft into the client, was we had a link in Minecraft, the client, the, the child would uh, click on that link, they'll give them a URL, they'll put it into a web browser, opens up a new tab, and there's their information. Which was great until we are selling you know, 15, 20, 30 tabs, and so on, kept opening and bigger and bigger. And we can see down the path that that wasn't really going to work with what we needed with two-way communication, because then every tab is going to be talking to the server with the same information. So we tried finding ways to close them using window close and stuff like that, but because of all the malware and hackers and all that stuff, they've pretty much blocked all that nowadays. So it was time for another pivot, and along came Electron meant to come save the day. We have solved the tab problems. We now only have one web browser to code with, which is Electron. Electron, yeah. for those yeah. who don't know, uh, is a nifty little framework yeah. that allows you to basically run a, a desktop app, uh, which is actually just a browser window, basically. Yeah. Just a browser. And, uh, it uses the Chromium yeah. browser. And so <laughs> Electron sounds amazing. It sounds like it solved all our problems. And people said, saying, no, 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 man. You just take your web app and you put an electron and you've just got one thing to worry about. Like, it's going to be sweet. It's going to be great. Until you realize that one executable has been compiled three ways and is running on all sorts of configurations. So as I'm overweight and you know, Ian's on the bigger side, we're both experts in cake. And so now I give you all the permission to say these words to any person who says electron is a silver bullet. The cake is a lie. <laughs> Stay away. <laughs> So, with those problems, it's not a big problem for us, but we're considering our client base is around eight years old. Installing programs for them was a big blocker. And I think it was uh, over the, the summer of code with the uh, libraries, we were spending a lot of time when we were using this, trying to get the kids up and running in Electron, mm -hmm. that they weren't using Minecraft. So, it was time for another pivot. Back to React and TypeScript. It took us nearly a week of three people working 17 to 18 hour days. Josh, myself, another fellow called Michael, who spoke here, I think, in December. I yeah. think. And uh, it took us that long to get everything working properly in React, sorry, in uh, Electron, getting everything built up and working, working on Windows, Linux, Mac. We got signatures signed up, so any device program stopped complaining. And take a guess of how long it took to remove Electron from our product. Before you show it, actually, someone guess how long do you think yeah. it takes to go out of Electron if it took three day, guys nearly how long? 17, 18 hour days. Mm. Half an hour? Has anyone got anyone else? How long? Five minutes. Wow, you guys think we're inches. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you think so highly of us. Yeah. Actually, it took two hours. 
two hours to strip the electron completely out and have nothing to do with it. That, with that basically comes down to how yeah. uh, React yeah. works. Oh, sorry, how Electron works. It basically just wraps yeah. your your JavaScript HTML app uh, and makes it run as a native yeah. app. Now there were improvements on the way, and Tim spoke earlier about how we use PouchDB to store data. We have Cloud uh, running a, a, a cache. Um, uh, DB. We use WebSockets for optimistic updates. Uh, we did that because when sending data from the client to the Minecraft server, the synchronizing on the patch DB doesn't always go lightning fast. Sometimes it can take up to a minute for, to go there. So if somebody was to make a new spell, we can't just have um, them wait there constantly trying to cast a spell with errors. So we have to have an optimistic update. And that's what to use. This has allowed us then to uh, the WebSockets allowed us to push law and requests from Minecraft instantly into the client that the, that the user is allowed to use. And they have little notification windows opens up and it makes React change the routes that we have in there or you know, which, whatever. This is our current tech stack. So on the left you see all our GitHub repos. So we have the JS API, which the it's small. <laughs> so do you just want to do a quick overview? Yeah. So we have nine, nine, sorry, eight repos that runs that compiles into and, uh, so four different, so three different Docker images, and they get compiled into the Docker uh, composite compositions, which then go get deployed up to the server. Now, any. Any push to the GitHub repo triggers a new image, which then triggers a new uh, ad, you know, and so on. And all this was what was built in the last five, six weeks. Mm -hmm. Five, six weeks. And we need all this just so we can kill a, a, a zombie with a lightning bolt. At scale. <laughs> <laughs> so? Yep, it's now Briggsy. Woo! <laughs> So I think this is the first time me talking at BrizJS because I'm famously quoted as likening JavaScript to causing the apocalypse. And every time I go near anyone who does JavaScript, I get reminded of that. So I'm nervous. I read once in a book that the best way of getting over bigger nerves is to share something personal with the group. So I'm going to tell you one of my bucket list titles. And that's to get into the Guinness Book of World Records. I know that's insane, but we'll get there. And so I see this tweet from Josh Wolf saying, you know what we're going to do? We're going to set a world record for killing the most zombies with JavaScript lightning bolts in Minecraft at Ignite. My response is, let's do this shit. <laughs> and so, you know, we go and we get a trailer out. And so this is to give you an idea of what the event is going to be like before we jump into how we did it. This summer at Microsoft Ignite Australia, prepare yourself for the Magicraft zombie apocalypse. Magicraft empowers kids with magical abilities. By learning to cast spells with simple JavaScript, once they've mastered their basic spell slinging, they will be offered to join the resistance against the zombie apocalypse. The main goal of the resistance is to kill the most zombies possible and set a world record. In this session, participants will learn how to throw a lightning bolt that they themselves have programmed in pure JavaScript. <coughs> this event is for the whole family We'd love to eat them. Oops, I mean eat them. <laughs> so after watching that, you'd know two things about me. One, I'm a dweeb, and two, I have a massive problem on my hands. <laughs> so to set a world record, you need two things, I found out. One, it has to be interesting enough that if you opened the Guinness World Book of Records and you read it, you'd go, wow, that person is awesome, crazy, or a bit of both. We've got that locked, we've got that down pat. But the second thing is you need a certain level of pseudoscience, let's be honest. We need a certain level of wearing lab coats with timers so we can say X number of zombies died in one hour. So how are we going to track this? And this is something that really was a bugbear of mine. So who here has actually tried to run a Minecraft server before? Can I get a quick show of hands? You have? You have? You have? Would everyone agree that Minecraft will chew your resources like no one's business? So the goal was to then move it off. It had to be moved somewhere else. It couldn't be on those hosts. So instead, we moved it up to Azure Functions. 
or some kind of serverless compute. Now, the reason we did this is because I felt the need, the need to be able to scale indefinitely. So, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm at Neverworld, which is that new pub in Brisbane where you can play some pinball, arcade games, board games, and you can have a few drinks. I've got a napkin, I've got my girlfriend there, and I'm scribbling ideas, I'm scribbling ideas, I'm scribbling ideas, and the next day, luckily not hungover, I design up the architecture diagram. And so I'm gonna walk you through a couple of steps. The first at top is those Minecraft servers. They are big boxes, but they don't have much free memory. You know, they're all running Docker, they all have logging endpoints out, but they can't do any computing. They're basically gonna do a push, 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 push. Whatever the event happens, we're gonna get it out of there into someone who has free space. So then we push that all out into a Azure function, written in JavaScript, that has a REST endpoint. And basically, what it's gonna do is take the message, it's gonna look at the JSON and say, cool, do you have a type? If yes, I'm gonna put you in the right queue and get yourself to the right worker. Otherwise, I'm gonna ignore you existed and complain. And the nice thing about this endpoint is that because it's serverless, I don't care how big it is, I only pay when it runs and for every time it runs. So I can, at the moment, it costs me nothing, but as soon as Ignite comes, it can get smashed for 10,000 requests in a minute and it will just scale up. It really reacts quite nicely to that scale bursts. So then you know, each one of those is a storage queue, which then passes onto a worker. So what could happen is, let's say you know we're playing, we're playing, we're playing, we're playing, and one of the workers in D dies. Oh no, shit's hit the fan. We haven't lost any data because those messages can sit in the queue and the storage cost of seeing a message in the queue is basically free. When you start thinking about it, it's basically free. So we have a really resilient architecture where we're taking messages, we're scaling quickly, we're putting them in queues. We don't care if our D tier dies, but if it does survive and if it can de queue a message, it will go put it in a flat table. So we're taking that JSON and we're flattening it down. Now, Querying Azure Table Storage, if anyone's done that here, they'll know it's not really the most fun because it's technically, um, can you use the password? So it's technically it's schemaless, and so it has some weirdness around what you can and, and the performance costs of doing certain kind of lookups. That is way too much for any person who doesn't want to do this daily to learn. So I decided that I would actually create some additional Azure functions that would read the data in the correct way, munch it down, and give you a pile of stats. So for example, breakdowns of the scoreboard, most spells cast, who's killed the most zombies, who's the biggest badass, who's the most powerful wizard, all these things are computed by an Azure function and then spat back out to the web apps that requested. But there's one hitch. Even in this simple scenario, I have what? Six functions, uh, nine queues, how many rest endpoints? If one message goes astray, it's a real pain to find. And in the early development, it'd be sometimes you know, you're up late, one o'clock in the morning, and you accidentally capitalize a property name in the wrong way, and okay, your entire thing does, your cascade falls down. So how do you do this? Well, the best way, in my opinion, is you need to have some kind of logging, so that way, when shit hits the fan, you can go and do an autopsy of it. And the best thing is, when you do a world record attempt, people will give you free stuff. So <laughs> Seek is a great structured logging platform, Best of all, written in, in uh, Brisbane by Nick Bloomhart. So for the .NET guys in the room, you'd know Nick Bloomhart wrote Autofact, he wrote Serilog. I'm pretty sure he's actually a cyborg sent back from the future because he doesn't sleep. He just writes code in mountain bikes. <laughs> so here you see, I have my event log that's going down. So each of these groups is basically a message coming here. It get, comes in and as time happens, you know, it gets action passed along the set, the states and everything else. This doesn't actually look very helpful, to be honest. Bar being able to watch it tick down and think, wow, this is cool, look at all the events that are going into my Azure system. It has one really nice feature. Because it's structured logging, we can actually pass objects to the log, and it will then show them up as property object pairs. And so that way, we can actually go in and inspect those objects. And best of all, we can actually write a SQL-like query syntax to let us query those events. And so if you, as long as you set a GUID at the beginning when that first event comes in, it's incredibly easy to track it all the way through the system. So this is just something I shot before I came along where we're doing some light testing and Seek was ingesting 4,000 log events per minute without breaking a sweat. So it works quite nicely. Actually, it has saved me a few sleepless nights. Now, I like freebies because 
he doesn't. I have one question. If you can get it right, I will throw this t-shirt at you. I apologize if I hurt you in the process. <laughs> How much do you think I've spent to date building this distributed system? Zero. Say zero. Anyone else? Twelve How much? Twelve dollars? <coughs> Twenty? Twenty? So you said zero? <laughs> okay, anyone else? Yeah. Two hundred bucks? No. <laughs> <laughs> I spent ten cents. That's all. In the last two months, I have spent ten cents on Azure to do this. I have handled over a hundred thousand messages and I could literally not buy anything for the cost of it. So, mate, you're, you're the closest. I am going to throw this at you. Ooh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I apologize. So, really, I recommend having a look at Azure Functions if you get into this kind of situation. It makes it really easy for the parsing. And also, it's cheap. It is so dang cheap and quick and easy to get up. You're writing it with the same JavaScript you know and love. And if you're like me and the .NET guy and you think that link was the best invention ever, you can even write it in C Sharp. So now I'm going to pass over to Ian. He's going to show you the demo of the actual event. Uh, yes, this is our Microsoft Ignite. Uh, super quick graphic that we did. Um, I'm going to try a live demo here, actually. So, wish me luck. Yep. So this is our zombie scoreboard. This is written in JavaScript. It has a uh, express backend for. Um, let me actually go view full screen. Yeah, it has an express uh, backend for like uh, logging some events, and it's actually just a jQuery. I did it in an afternoon. It's got lots of gifts, as you can see. And the idea with this is it uh, logs the uh, on on the night night when we do it at uh, uh, MS Ignite going to have basically 40 or 50 people trying to kill zombie hordes with lightning bolts and fireballs and we're going to tally uh, the outcome of that. So actually I have a... Um, and what makes this actually dangerous is we're going to tell the kids but we have Minecraft toys for them. So all of a sudden we're, we're going to drive them nuts and they're going to throw as much lightning bolts as many zombies as they humanly can. So I actually have a mock emitter here. Start throwing some events at it. Yep. Yeah, it'll refresh it. Yeah, it starts ticking over. And this is what it actually looks like in Minecraft. Oops, a bit difficult. Oh, okay. Unaccessible. <laughs> 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 what can I do? Alright, this could be a problem. Somewhere. Okay, maybe the live demo is not going to happen. Project yeah. issues. It's already launched, should be running. Is it the actual? Sorry. Yes. I can jump down. Other one. All right, I won't, won't keep everyone up I'm trying to get a live demo working, so thanks a lot. Uh, we're Magicraft. We're at MS Ignite on the 13th of February. If you'd like to come down, that's on the Gold Coast. Uh, you can go to uh, magicraft.io. It's magic with a K, craft. Um, so you can uh, find out more about the event there. And we're also doing a hackathon, which is on the 17th, 18th, and 19th. Uh, it's the weekend after uh, MS Ignite. And that's for uh, type 1 diabetes. So we're actually rolling a uh, Magicraft release um, for um, kids with diabetes. The idea is that when a uh, kid gets, first gets diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, they um, go into hospital, usually to get everything back into balance. And at that time, they also get educated like how to take care of their um, diabetes, um, you know, how to calculate how much insulin they need to take and so forth. 
which is actually a lot of maths and it's quite boring. And we wanted to try and make that fun. The reason we're doing this actually is because Josh's son happens to have type 1 diabetes, so that's an issue close to his heart. And the hackathon is going to be to develop this uh, Minecraft version where basically you, you're running around in Minecraft and those who know Minecraft knows that you have to eat food. They bring your um, <coughs> drumstick bar back up, your health bar, and when that becomes full then your health goes up again and if, if you get down to zero food, then you start losing health until you die. So <coughs> in, um, uh, when you've got type 1 diabetes in Minecraft, you're going to eat food and you're not going to get any benefit. So then you have to like take insulin and you have to calculate how much insulin you need to take in order to um, actually get benefit from the food. So you can measure your different food types, how much uh, their carb counts, and then you do a calculation to see how much insulin you need to take. You take some insulin and then you um, carry on happily in the game. So that's it, 17th, 18th, 19th. We want everyone who's uh, interested in that has some technical abilities, has some storytelling abilities, design abilities. Uh, who wants to be involved? Um, yeah. Please come along. You can uh, book through our website or talk to us personally. Um, yeah, that's at Fishburners, so it's downtown Brisbane. Yeah. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much. questions for these folks. They've shown you a lot of stuff and you should definitely get some questions. <laughs> yes. Anyone got any hands up? This guy already has beat you to it. There you go. Uh, if you don't mind, I have two questions. One, yeah. you mentioned you have a website and then you mentioned serverless. So where do, the, where do they go? Like, where do they get connected to? So let's take two questions. Do you want to take the sockets part and I'll jump in about the serverless part? Yeah, yeah. Can I ask the second one? Oh, okay. Right so, away? yeah. So, I was just wondering because I'm doing some relay and GraphQL at the moment and it has optimistic updates. It's really interesting how it does it. So, you don't really need web sockets for that. So, have you considered doing that? So, do you want to take this one here and I'll talk about the little bit Well, the optimist bit. Honestly, um, Josh did a lot of the optimistic updates in that one. Uh, I know he's. You know, yeah, yeah. So web sockets, yeah. uh, our actual um, product is not serverless. The serverless component is um, for this uh, statistics cruncher, which we're basically going to spit out a whole lot of kill events and uh, spell casting events from Minecraft. They get pushed up to uh, Chris's um, Azure function. Thing which crunches them, and that's all serverless. So when it's not been used, it just spins down, doesn't do anything. The web sockets we use in our app because we have like a client side app that uses PouchDB. PouchDB is like a, um, a browser version of CouchDB. So it sits in the browser, it uses local storage and WebSQL, a few things. Very lightweight, very fast, and you get syncing for free. So you can actually do like specify a remote database. Um, put some data in there and then you can tell it to do a sync event and it will just automatically sync with a remote, which is really great. So It is really reasonably fast, but uh, as I said earlier, it takes, sometimes it will be instant, other times it can take up to a minute for the data to appear. Yeah, so what, what we do, like for example, if you're running around in Minecraft, in Magicraft world, you might discover some, what we call Magicraft lore, which is usually like a hologram of some magic word, you type that into the command line and, it, and then you get that pushed into your spell book. So the way we do that actually is we, uh, um, we sync it into the Cloud Ant database which then syncs down to the browser. But in order for that to happen instantly, we use a WebSocket and we just push it straight to the app so we do an optimistic update. So they're actually, they're actually related. The optimistic update sends it immediately and then we send it Cloud Ant, which then syncs down to the pouch in the browser. So the, the user gets instant feedback, but then we're also making sure we're actually persisting that by putting is it in the database. The WebSocket is sort of hard for a persistent connection to your server. Well, it's not, it's not, I mean, that's the power of Node, right? That when it's not in use, it's not really doing anything. It just goes to false idle. And uh, I mean, we, we don't really have scaling problems at this stage. We don't have like, 
thousands of concurrent users at the moment. But yeah, we'll see, we'll see down the track where that goes. But yeah, WebSockets is, is a good solution for us now because it allows the uh, app to talk to the server. We, we have multiple components. We have actual Minecraft server, and then we have like a, a back end to our app. And the Minecraft server talks to our back end, which then talks to the app. So we need to be able to like uh, talk back and forth. Previously, we were doing it with the uh, HTTP REST requests. Uh, the WebSocket gives you a bit more uh, power there. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? So I can show you. Is that on the screen? Sure is. Yeah. Awesome. So there's some zombies here. So I can summon some zombies. Full screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the trouble with projectors, right? Uh, how do I get out of full screen? Is that better? Yeah. yeah. I can't just see it all. Right. So I've got a spell here which summons zombies. I'm going to summon 10 zombies. And then I'm going to lightning bolt them. They ignore me because I'm in God mode. Actually, I can do this on a mass, much more massive scale here. 100 zombies. <laughs> and then we're going to... This is how we're going to get the world, world record, basically. We're going we're gonna to spin up a like, $200 an hour server with like, epic capacity. There you go, you spent it on bro. <laughs> yeah, the server spits free, the server's up. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's happening is every time he's casting a spell, the uh, logging is actually firing off a message out to Azure, and that's then getting passed through the handlers and getting saved into the flight storage. What's going to happen is every time one of those zombies dies, another message is going to get sent off for each death. And that's all going to get chomped up and work out that you know Tim is an amazing lightning bolt casting god of killing zombies. <laughs> it's all going to get pump piped into this thing here. Which is our ultra retro scoreboard. Any other questions? She brought what about a week to you know, like, you know, time to replace zombie Nazis? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> one of the developers was working on changing skins of existing. So, I don't know. <laughs> well, actually, we implemented a, um, a feature freeze, and that was Sunday. So, you missed the feature freeze deadline, but next time, just give us the suggestions a bit earlier. 3,000. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, we, we actually decided recently that we're going to probably leave most of our um, uh, content creation to our users because. They're really passionate about it, and they're actually a lot <coughs> better than us at it as well. Like the kids, they love it. Oops. Yeah. So something you're going to enjoy, Chris, is when we first started thinking of cool things we could do to Ignite, I actually began building a lantern that would actually react to the um, events coming out of the server. Uh -huh. And the only thing that stopped me actually building this lantern was realizing that to get LEDs bright enough so you'd be able to see them in a room lit up like this with 40 kids, Josh would have to hold up a lantern connected to 240 mains power. <laughs> and for some reason, I didn't think he would want to do that. So that, that killed that project and we went to the scoreboard. It's amazing when you walk into Ultronics and you ask for those kind of LEDs. They just stop talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? What's the current record? Chris? <laughs> the current record, I think someone's killed 2,000 zombies would be the current record in one of the stress tests, last I checked. Oh, the current record with us? It's actually a non-existent record. So we thought if we, if we choose some super obscure record, we'll just claim all the superlatives. <laughs> the first, the best. Yeah. Last night we'll test on different servers, how many zombies we can get onto a particular server, how much RAM it needs. Yeah. And we got up to, um, I think it was 24 cores with 256 gig of RAM, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I was costing Josh um, something like seven or eight dollars a minute to run. But let's be honest, he was getting more than eight dollars worth of joy out of being able to kill that many zombies <laughs> and not have the box fall over. 
just the laughing and the cackling. Yeah. <laughs> Chris? Yeah, you mentioned sec, was it? Sec. Yeah. <coughs> uh, does that allow you to pass the lines after they've been ingested? Uh, yes. So as long as you pass the object through, you can query and do stuff based on what's currently stored in C. <coughs> yeah. But is it a little bit limited? What you can get away with? From what I see, it's basically smart logging rather than just having like a giant basically text document. Mm. You have logs that you can carry. How does it compare against something like Sumo? Uh, so I'll tell you the reason that I, I love C, and that has to be because I have to admit it in a room full of JavaScript developers, I'm actually a .NET dev by trade, that's my day-to-day -day job. And Siri log, which is the logging package that Nick's also written, which works really well in the .NET stack, and works really well with Autofac, which is his IOC container, which is really nice. And so there's kind of like this holy trinity of the bloom heart, where if you use these three things together in .NET, even on .NET Core, which is like the unstable cross-platform .NET, it all works nicely. So I have to admit, I've kind of stayed in seek because it's nice and it's actually quite nice, and it all just works if you take the ISC container of the logging framework and then the thing to do structured logging analysis. Yeah, cool. okay. Josh would be a good one to ask about that. He's used it. I mean, we've got so many moving parts in this thing, it's necessary to specialize at this stage. He's probably the one that's most across everything. Yeah. So yeah, he's, he's used it a lot and he recommends it. So. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool, cool thanks. I'm going to go over time.